Our top focus today as Europe was hoping it could put COVID to rest, the virus has risen again with renewed vigour. Case numbers have been rising and in their wake, hospital admissions as well. Each country is now trying to find the right combination of measures, local lockdowns, test and trace initiatives, economic support as well as public communication to drive down the numbers as winter approaches with the fresh cases being reported and a resurgence in Europe. France has reported more than 30,000 cases in 24 hours, that's the highest ever, while Italy is poised to be removed from England's travel corridor. The World Health Organization has said that the soaring numbers of COVID cases in Europe is of great concern, but that the situation is still better than the peaks that we saw in April. The United Kingdom has a three-tier alert system for different regions in place, and while London has entered a tighter COVID lockdown phase. Well, to talk more about the UK as well as Europe, what we're seeing, we're joined by Dr. Sonia Adesara, doctor with the National Health Services there in the UK, who's been closely tracking the spread of COVID as well as the government's response. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Now, it's a very tricky and very, very challenging situation that the UK and other European countries uh, find themselves in uh, with this, uh, with coronavirus once again on the surge and uh, to bring back the lockdowns and restrictions. It's, it's very tricky, but they don't seem to have much choice. Yeah, we are in a very difficult, concerning situation in the UK and Europe. We're seeing the virus rates increase exponentially, and we're seeing more people getting admitted to hospital. We're seeing outbreaks in hospital. Again, there are concerns now that we may run out of hospital capacity. Um, so it does feel like we're back to square one with this virus. We're back to where we were in March. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of frustration and a lot of, you know, I guess, anger towards our governments that they've not been able to get a grip on the control of this virus like some other countries have. Um, and we now find ourselves in the situation that to, you know, to protect lives, we're having to go back into local lockdowns. Um, and of course, local lockdowns are um, harm also harmful to people's health, people's well-being, people's mental health. It's across it businesses, it costs jobs. Um, so it's a really um, concerning and frustrating situation that we are finding ourselves in again, you know, six months down the line. Absolutely, because, you know, as, as you said, it's, it's this balancing of the lives and livelihoods is, is what governments now are faced with. You know, it's had a devastating impact on the economy. But at the same time, you're worried about the public health, but the public itself is very, very fatigued and resentful of these measures. So it's very challenging now uh, for the countries to deal with this. Yes, and I think, you know, there is fatigue and I think there is frustration, for, um, there is frustration amongst the public um, that the government hasn't been able to get control of this virus. And we did have a, a national lockdown in March and April, which was a very long lockdown, it was very difficult for a lot of people, and the virus rates did come down. And I think the frustration is that the, that the government didn't manage to get a functioning test and trace system. They didn't manage to keep control of the virus. They encouraged people to go out to work, to go out to restaurants. And then we saw the virus rates spreading um, and they told people to go back to university. So, you know, just in the past few weeks, we've had millions of, you know, young people from yeah. different parts of the country move around, move together. Um, and then we've seen outbreaks in university towns. So, you know, I think there's a lot of feeling that actually the outbreak that we're seeing now and the loss of control of the virus wasn't inevitable. It could have been prevented if the government had a bit more of a strategic control over this virus. Um, and there is frustration that we are now having to go back into restrictions. People can't see their loved ones, um, the impact it has on jobs. But also we have, you know, we've got Diwali coming up, we've got Christmas coming up. There's a real concern that people won't be able to spend time with their families during that time. And that's taken a real toll, I think, on people's, you know, mental health and their emotional well-being as well. Right, absolutely. You know, uh, the combination of people wanting to spend time with their loved ones and family members during this festival season, but also worry about the spike in COVID cases that may take place after uh, the festive season here in India as well. We're facing that challenge. Uh, what can we learn from the countries that seem to have gotten it right? If we talk about, you know, New Zealand, Vietnam, Japan, even China, where it all began right now, has totally flattened that curve. And they're really going after any cases that may even come up there so uh, do you think these countries have have very different uh, populations different examples and and we can't compare them with i don't know uk us even india uh, what do you think is what do you feel we can learn from these countries yeah i think we can compare and i think we can learn because at the end of the day we are all faced with the same virus and um, so it's important that we learn from countries that are getting it right I think there's four really key things. You know, number one, having really clear 
messaging and communication on the public health interventions from the government from the start. I think that was missing in the UK and the US um, and some of the European countries. Um, and number two, having a really comprehensive and robust testing system. So you're picking up all new cases really, really quickly within 24 hours. And then you're also notifying all of their contacts, anyone that they've had contacted with and um, who potentially have the virus. And then number three, anyone that has the virus or has been in contact with the virus, they need to be able to isolate for 14 days. That means not having contact with anyone. And here it's the government's responsibility to ensure that people are able to do that, to make sure that they have you know, the economic support to do that, make sure that they have, you know, that they have enough money to get food in that time, people can't work, make sure that they're able to feed their families. You know, in, in the UK, this has been a real problem because we know that only about 20% of people with symptoms have actually been isolating. Um, and that's because, you know, people can't, you know, there's a lot of people in this country who can't just not work for a few weeks. They have real fears about feeding their families. So here the government need to ensure that everyone that has symptoms, has the virus or has been contacted with someone with the virus, has all the support there um, to enable them to isolate. And then, you know, I think as we are now going into lockdowns again in Europe, I think the government needs to do much more to support businesses that are now at risk um, of losing their business and people at risk of losing their jobs. And because I think unemployment, not being able to work, um, going, into, going into a big recession that we face will also have a really massive impact on the long-term health of the nation. The government needs to be doing more to prevent the harm from that. Right, and currently when we don't have any cure for this disease, when we don't have vaccine, it's the doctors, as they keep telling you, what we can do is just wear masks and socially distance. Coming back to the examples of, of Vietnam, Japan, etc., do you think it's because over there masks are very part and parcel of the flu season? They, you know, they don't have any issues with masks. As soon as the season begins, everybody gets masked up there, so it wasn't very difficult to get the population to mask up, whereas we're seeing a lot of pushback against masks in the West, which is, you know, uh, people actually protesting against it and questioning the wearing of masks yeah and I think this comes down to to trust as well and um, I think we have a situation in the UK and then US where we have I guess political leaders themselves not wearing masks um, and and then then I guess the the message about whether or not it's needed becomes more um, murky so I think there's some countries and some governments that have been very I think firm from the start and very clear about what needed to done and that's why I said you know messaging is really really clear here um, and I think also you, you see in countries um, not just in the West but countries where there was before this virus a general mistrust in their governments have been handling this virus really badly whereas the countries that um, prior to this virus trusted their governments and um, trusted what their government said trusted their media and um, then you see that the public are, are following the interventions um, you know better and more and are more to the dot and we are seeing in those countries that they are able to get a better control of this virus so i think there's a real learning point as well for the future here because we will be facing future pandemics this is not the, and it's not the last and it's likely we'll be experiencing sure. more pandemics more frequently because of global warming and um, there's a lot of lessons governments need to be learning from this absolutely thank you so much dr sonia Adesara, for speaking to us here at ndtv thank you for having me